Hello to our friends joining us via recording. We are starting our discussion of neuron physiology. To help us understand the way that neurons work, we needed to remind ourselves of an idea way back from unit number one, the beginning of our anatomy class. And this was the idea that the cells in our body are kind of like a salty banana. So this is an analogy for us, calling them a salty banana is an analogy to help us remember where we've got a lot of sodium, a lot of potassium, and a lot of chloride. Now, before I start labeling where we've got a lot of each of these things, uh, can my friends here in class help me out in the chat? Which of these things, sodium, potassium, or chloride, which of these is what we would call a cation? A cation. That's another unit one word. Okay, so a couple of us are, are landing on potassium. Uh, when I when I use that word cation, by the way, maybe we should remember what that is. What what is a cation? What did a cation mean? Yeah, cation means it's got a positive charge. So when I see it in the ion form, if it's got a positive charge, it's a cation. So lots of us were correct. Potassium is a cation. And the other one that a couple of us noticed as well was sodium. Sodium is a cation. Does anyone happen to remember what the word was that I used uh, for chloride? Chloride's got a negative charge. What are those ones called? Yeah, so chloride with its negative charge, that's called an anion. These are the three types of ions we care about when we're thinking about neuron signaling. Sodium, so that's Na+, potassium, that's K+, and chloride, that's Cl-. Okay, so we've come up with our abbreviations for each of these things, and we can see their charges. Now we need to figure out who lives inside and outside this salty banana cell. So let's start with the inside. Which of those ions that we talked about would I find inside my cell? Who lives inside the cell? Yeah, potassium lives inside the cell. K plus uh, lives inside the cell. When you think about a banana, bananas are really high in potassium. So lots of potassium on the inside. It's a salty banana. So that means then that I've got sodium and I've got chloride. Add my chloride. Both of those on the outside of the cell. So sodium and chloride, the two things that make salt on the outside, potassium on the inside. Now, when we talk about neuron signaling, we talk about the way that cells work, we're going to use channel proteins to move things. Can we remember when we talk about a channel protein, uh, do those do active or passive transport? Channel proteins, active or passive transport. Ooh, we're questioning. We're 50-50 split. So I'll help us out with this one because this will, will be an important thing for us to remember. Yeah, so channel proteins, whether it's a leakage channel or a gated channel, channel proteins always do passive transport. They always do passive transport. Meaning, like Nicole mentioned in the chat, we're always going from high to low. We're always doing passive transport with a channel protein. Yeah, Jesse's like, I knew that. I just mixed it up. That's totally fine. Channel proteins, always passive. If we think back to, um, I think it was unit number one, when we talked about carrier proteins those were the ones that did active transport if you were searching in your mind for the name of the other ones so channel proteins were doing passive transport that matters for me because when we talk about the direction that things are going to move 
it's all about concentrations. So we're always going from where there's a high concentration to where there's a low concentration. So when I talk about sodium, I've got a lot of it here on the outside, which means sodium wants to go inside. Sodium is coming inside. When I talk about potassium, there's a lot of potassium inside. That means potassium wants to go out, get away. And when I'm talking about chloride, there's a lot of it outside, which means that it wants to go inside. Okay, so here's what we've defined so far. We've defined where I find my various ions, and we've said which way they're moving, either into the cell or out of the cell. Now we have to add together the, the way that they move and their charge to help us figure out what they're gonna do to the membrane when I move them this way. Now, let's back up to a membrane word from unit number one. I had a name for the normal charge on a neuron's membrane. For the normal charge on any cell's membrane. Does anyone remember what we called that normal charge? It'll take a lot of typing, probably. Yeah, so, so Jacqueline abbreviated it for us, which is perfect because it's super long. The, the name of the normal charge on the membrane of a cell is called the resting membrane potential or abbreviated RMP, resting membrane potential. I'll probably end up using that abbreviation today. So normal charge. There are, are two types of cells we had to know the resting membrane potential on. The first one is the one that we did in chapter number nine or lesson number nine. What was the number on a muscle cell? Does anyone remember what the resting membrane potential was on a muscle cell or technically a muscle fiber? Yeah, so my, my muscle fibers were tricky. They were negative 90 millivolts. Everybody else in the body, including the ones that we're going to focus on today, when we're talking about neurons or your other types of cells in the body, what's that number for neurons? Neurons aren't negative 90. Yeah, there come my answers. Negative 70 millivolts. Most cells in the body are at negative 70. Almost everybody who's polarized is negative 70. Specifically in our class, we're focusing on neurons being at negative 70. Muscle fibers are at negative 90. So they're even more negative. Their resting membrane potential is even more negative than, than those neurons. But the big idea with resting membrane potential is we're pretty much never at zero. Zero is bad news for your membrane. Zero means we're probably dead. So neurons normally at negative 70. We're focusing on neurons this, this lesson. Okay, so let's imagine that on my salty banana cell here, my resting membrane potential is negative 70. That means that inside is has 70 more negatives than outside. So I've got 70 negatives inside here but I open up a channel for sodium. We said that sodium comes inside the cell. When sodium comes inside the cell, it brings its charge, it's positive with it. So what effect do we have on our membrane charge when sodium comes in to the cell? Does it get more positive or more negative? And sodium comes in. Yeah, it's going to become more positive. When sodium comes inside, it brings its positive charges with it. Just as a frame of reference, in case the numbers are, are freaking you out a little bit, we always compare inside to outside. So when I say that I, I'm bringing sodium inside, that makes the inside more positive than, than it used to be. It used to be all negative inside. So we bring sodium inside, that brings its positive charge with it. 
that makes it more positive. Okay, let's go to the other one that's going in. Chloride is also going into the cell. Chloride has a negative charge. So what happens when chloride comes into the cell? What happens to the membrane charge when chloride comes in? Yeah, exactly. Chloride is bringing its negative charge with it. So chloride becomes more negative. It brings more negativity into the cell. Now, potassium is a little trickster over here. Potassium has a positive charge. We said that when we open a channel for potassium, potassium leaves the cell. Potassium has a positive charge. When my positive charges leave, I'm basically doing subtraction. So what's going to happen to my membrane charge when potassium leaves the cell? Are we going to get more positive or more negative when potassium leaves? Yeah, so when potassium leaves, we also get more negative. We also get more negative. Sodium and chloride, those ones are pretty intuitive. Potassium is one you might want to consider memorizing because it, it's a little bit harder to think about. When positives leave the inside to go to the outside, the inside is losing its pluses. That makes the inside seem more negative than it did when the potassiums were inside. Where I hope we're going to get by the end of our class today is talking about how sometimes when a neuron gets a message, it opens up a channel that moves sodium. So if, if a neuron receives a message that opens a chemically gated sodium channel, sodium comes inside and that's gonna make my membrane charge more positive. When we think about the way that neurons work, if we get more positive, that's going to make my neuron excited or get it ready to talk to its neighbor. So if a message lets sodium into that neuron, that's gonna make the neuron want to talk to its friends. But if the neuron gets a message that lets in chloride, it attaches to a chemically gated chloride channel, that's gonna let chloride inside, and chloride makes my membrane charge more negative. When I'm more negative, I'm less likely to wanna to talk to my neighbors. So if you send me a message that opens up a chemically gated chloride channel, the charge on my membrane gets more negative. That means I don't wanna to talk to anybody. Or if you send me a message that opens up a chemically gated potassium channel, and I'm letting my potassium go outside, if you send me one of those messages, my membrane charge is also going to get more negative, and I'm also not gonna to wanna to talk to my neighbors. So keep the salty banana in the back of your mind. When we're talking about the kinds of messages that neurons can send to each other, the way they send a message that says, hey, I've got hot gossip I want you to share with somebody, I'm gonna open up a channel for sodium. If we're trying to send a message, hey, keep this on the down low, don't tell anybody, we're gonna open up a potassium channel or a chloride channel. So salty banana, back to haunt us as always. But hey, I think once we get through this chapter, I don't think the salty banana, oh, I lied actually. The salty banana is gonna come back up in, in the last chapter. So it's always there. <laughs> yeah, Ariel found the banana. Yeah, and it's like, psych, yeah, pretty much. I, I thought it was done. Actually, what, what's gonna be crazy when we talk about the, the salty banana cells is when we're doing the special senses, which is things like hearing and balance, we actually freak out our salty banana and it's a little bit different than normal. So this is probably the last time we'll do the salty banana like regular. And then I'll be mean and flip it up on you in the end, because that's the way that anatomy works, right? We're just out to get you. Not really. Anatomy is. Dr. Aulis isn't, but, but anatomy is, right? <laughs> All right. Let's dive into some of, of the content that you guys have here in lesson number 10. Lesson number 10 is all about the way that neurons work. 
Now, here's some review of lab stuff for us to, to help us out as we're starting to think about neurons. Remember from lab that there were two different ways that we could classify neurons. We could classify neurons based on their function. So we called it their functional classification. Or we could classify them based on their structure, their shape, if you will. Now, in lecture, we're not going to focus on the structural classification of a neuron, but lecture and lab are linked to each other, right? Can't do one without the other. So let's remind ourselves really fast. When we talk about the structural classification of neurons, here's our hint for what that structural classification was. I call them the polar words. Can anyone help me out in the chat? Do we remember any of the structural classification words for neurons? What those words were? It's been a little while. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Got, got, got some options coming in here. So one of those structural words is called unipolar. One of them is bipolar. One of them is multipolar. Absolutely. Yep. Those were my structural classification words. My structural classification words told me how many different things, how many different structures do you have coming off of the cell body of a neuron? Here, let's do a quick sketch. We'll do lots of neuron drawing today with my bad mouse, this is gonna be sad. Okay, typical multipolar neuron here. Remember in the neuron, we've got what's called the cell body, and then there are dendrites that collect information, and this axon that sends information away. A multipolar neuron is like the one that I drew here, where I got multiple extensions, that came off of it, lots of things coming off the cell body. When I talk about a bipolar neuron, how many extensions come off of a bipolar neuron? Yeah, two extensions off of a bipolar neuron. Absolutely right. Let's see if I can draw this without my mouse dying on me here. A bipolar neuron has the cell body in the middle of the neuron. So I've got one extension that has dendrites that collects information, one extension that has an axon and sends that information away. If I'm a unipolar neuron, how many extensions did we have on unipolar? Yeah, uni, like a unicycle, just one, one extension. One of, of the best places that we saw unipolar neurons were actually our sensory neurons. So I'm gonna add a little, a little cell body here to this neuron. In a unipolar neuron, all of the information that your dendrites collect goes straight into the axon to be processed. These neurons, this cell body, never actually sees that information. It doesn't do anything with it. So unipolar neurons, there's just one extension that comes off of the cell body. So any information I collect is sent away right away. Unipolar, bipolar, and multipolar. Those are my structural classifications of, of neurons. Primarily in, in our lecture class, we're going to focus on the functional classification. Functional classification. And that's what you see labeled here on the picture from your notes. When we talk about the functional classification, there are three kinds of functions that neurons do. The first one is a sensory type function. So a sensory function is when I collect sensory information. This can be information like we see in the picture here where I see a cup in front of me. This could be information like you touch that cup and it feels cold. Uh, this could be information like when you're walking, if you step on something and it's painful. 
Um, any of that kind of stuff is sensory information. Now, a sensory neuron only collects information. That's an important idea to keep in mind. Sensory neurons just collect information. They don't process it at all. The, I was gonna say the process of processing. I don't even know how better to say that though. Um, going through and processing information is called integration. So integration is when you figure out what that sensory information means. Integration is done by a type of neurons that are called interneurons. Interneurons, they do integration. So they collect that information from our sensory neurons. Sensory, interne sensory neurons give it all to those interneurons. The interneurons mix it all together, figure out what we should do with it. And then they talk to the motor neurons. Your motor neurons are the neurons that go directly to your muscles. They go directly to your organs or your glands and tell them what to do. So your sensory neuron sees that cup. Your interneuron says, I'd really like to pick up that cup. The motor neuron goes out to the arm, tells the arm, hey, this is one of our lab muscles from today, actually. Can we tell? What muscle is this one right here? Front side of your forearm. I'm all excited and everyone's like, we talked about this today? <laughs> what would be the muscle that would help you to do a curl? Yeah, there we go, it's, it's coming. Here's biceps brachii, right? It's attached to the arm, helping you to curl. We're, we're doing some intense workouts right here, lifting up our cup of water. The motor neuron talks directly to biceps brachii tells biceps brachii to pick up the cup. The interneuron is the one that decided, yeah, we should pick up that cup. The sensory neuron is the one that saw or collected the information that there was a cup in front of us. So three functional classifications of neurons, sensory, motor, and interneurons. We need all three of them to work correctly. Otherwise, we're in trouble. So you have a application activity in your lecture packet here. Um, if you've had a chance to work on this, can you click on the little hand raising guy that's that's right underneath my, my hand here? Okay, a few of us have had a chance to. Awesome. Okay, so uh, for some of us, this is going to be new and this will be be really fun, hopefully. Uh, this is one of my favorite things to talk about in class uh, when we're learning about the functional classifications of neurons. So what we're looking at here is something called congenital analgesia. So congenital analgesia is a condition where you can't respond to pain. Um, when you have a headache, for example, when you take ibuprofen or when you take Tylenol, that's called an analgesic. Its, it's job is to make you not feel pain or to make the pain feel better, put it that way. Congenital analgesia is a congenital disorder, meaning it's a genetic disorder in which people don't respond correctly to pain. So there's two different forms of congenital analgesia. One of them is called congenital pain insensitivity. When we talk about congenital pain insensitivity. My, my key with this one, let me get my underliner here. My key with this one is we don't even perceive a painful stimulus. Here, bear with me. I'm going to type a question. Based on the way that this question is worded, we're not perceiving a stimulus. Which of the types of neurons, you see them right over here, A, interneurons, B, motor neurons, C, sensory neurons. If I'm not perceiving a stimulus, which type of neuron 
might be giving me a problem. If you have no idea, you can just guess. It's completely, completely anonymous. Okay. Most of us have voted. And we all agree. When we are talking about congenital pain insensitivity, meaning I don't feel pain, that's an issue, or I don't perceive pain, that's going to be an issue with my sensory neurons. Perceiving a painful stimulus, detecting it, that's the job of a sensory neuron. So if I don't detect that stimulus, I got a problem with my sensory side of things. If my sensory neurons don't detect it, my interneurons won't do anything about it, my motor neurons get no directions. We can't do anything. The other form of this condition is called congenital pain indifference. In congenital pain indifference, I do perceive a painful stimulus. So I do detect, for example, that I'm stepping on a nail. But even though I detect I'm stepping on a nail, I don't respond to it. I, I don't make anything happen. We see if I can get my pole. I'm going to end that pole. And we're going to try again. In congenital pain indifference, considering that we perceive the stimulus, we don't trigger a response. Which kind of neuron would we say is a problem in congenital pain indifference? No response is triggered. There we go. I have at least one person who's going back and forth <laughs> between a couple of answer choices. So I need to watch on my end. Anybody else want to guess? <laughs> All right, let's see what we're thinking. We are divided between interneurons and motor neurons. Yeah, and Ariel's asking, are there two answers? So let's consider this as a class. If congenital pain indifference is a problem with interneurons, first, before we talk about them not functioning, what's the normal job of interneurons? What are interneurons supposed to do? If they're actually working, what do interneurons do? Yeah, exactly. Interneurons are my processing neurons. So I got a message. I, I felt something. I stepped on a nail. The job of an interneuron is to process what that sensation is. And like Hannah mentioned in the chat, absolutely, it's to predict what the right answer or the right response would be. If my interneuron receives information but doesn't process it correctly, or it doesn't send out directions for what the right response would be, that could make it so that I have no response. I don't decide I need to respond to it. I can feel that I'm stepping on a nail, but my body doesn't care that I'm stepping on a nail. That could be an interneuron problem. Absolutely. Hey, it could also be, I'll, I'll spoil the surprise, <laughs> it could also be an issue with motor neurons. How could this be a problem with motor neurons? Why could congenital pain indifference be a motor neuron problem? Yeah, so when we think about motor neurons, a motor neuron's job is to make things happen. We, we make a movement happen. Say I perceived a stimulus, so I collected that information that I was stepping on a nail. Say that I even processed that it was painful, but 
I, when I talked to my motor neuron and said, let's move the gastrocnemius muscle, my motor neuron was like, eh, I don't want to tell gastrocnemius to move. I know it's painful. I know it's what I'm supposed to do. Not, not digging, talking to gastrocnemius today. If that's the case, it'd be an issue with a motor neuron. The motor neuron is supposed to activate a muscle, make that muscle do something. If I don't tell the muscle to do something, and it's just because of my neuron side of things, then that would be a motor neuron issue. Uh, so let me read my thing here. Yeah, so, so really we, we were chatting about how there's two possible right answers for this, right? It could be A or it could be B. And when I do this in class, students always are like, but what's the right answer? <laughs> the right answer is either. It could be a problem because my internal neurons say, we don't care, we don't need to do anything. Or it could be an issue with my motor neurons. If the internal neurons tell them what to do, motor neurons don't go and talk to a muscle, that's going to be an issue with motor neurons. This is one of those tricky type questions that we do in class together and that we do in group work. I promise you on the exam, I'm not going to ask you a question where two of the answers are correct at the same time. So just for the record, I'm not going to be this mean on an exam, <laughs> on a graded assessment, but we're using it for, for the learning process. So either interneurons or motor neurons could be the cause of congenital pain indifference when I decide I'm just not going to respond to something that's painful. That could be motor problems, that could be interneuron integration problems. How do we feel about congenital analgesia? Thumbs up, thumbs down, questions? Good. Lots of thumbs up. Hey, I'll mention, don't know if I have any house fans in the audience. Um, they actually have a, an episode about congenital analgesia. I, I'm trying to remember because I've looked it up before. I think it's called indifferent um, or something like that because it has to do with, with this not feeling pain. So there is an episode I'll, I'll kind of ruin the episode for you. Um, this person who has congenital analgesia, she falls off of a, a two-story like balcony inside the hospital, breaks her femur, and just goes to stand right back up. She can't feel pain. <laughs> so she tries to stand up on a broken femur. Um, later in the episode, they realize what's causing all of her problems is that she has an intestinal parasite. And they take her into OR and they just do surgery on her completely awake, no anesthesia, because she feels no pain. So um, if you're interested in watching that, here, let me do a quick Google search. Let me see if that's what it's called. I feel like, uh, I'm gonna have to look it up for you later. Um, there, But there is, oh no, I think it's called insensitive. Let me see. I used to know too. Yes, it's called insensitive. Um, so if you are interested in, in watching an episode about a person who has congenital analgesia, the, the name of, of the episode of House is insensitive. Kind of like congenital pain insensitivity. She doesn't feel painful stimuli at all. So she just she just goes on and, and does crazy stuff. So insensitive, an, an episode of House. Because we all have tons of time on our hands, right? We just watch TV all the time. <laughs> That's a joke, because I don't watch TV either. <laughs> all right, so here's my, my funny for you. Here's my joke. I'll let you read it, and then we'll chat it. So we've got two muscle cells talking to each other here. And we're saying what would happen if they were interneurons. So one muscle cell says, sir, we're getting a signal from a neighboring neuron. What should we do? If muscle cells were acting like the interneurons, they would always say punch it, right? Always. Muscle cells are all about punch it. Do it, do it. 
Yeah, I like that, Nicole. Siblings, 100% correct. <laughs> so, so muscle cells, they should not be the ones doing the processing, right? They, they need a little guidance. They need that older sibling or that parent to intervene so that we're not always punching it. So there's a little comedy for us there about interneurons and, and motor neurons. All right, we get to have some fun and do some drawings. For who for that? Let me close my poll here, because that's annoying. Okay. So when we talk about neurons, you are never going to see a neuron by itself. Neurons are always talking to somebody, whether it's another neuron or whether it's a muscle cell, um, whether it's some kind of gland in the body, neurons are always talking. So let's start with the most basic way that I can have neurons talking to each other. I can have a series of two neurons in a line. If I have two neurons in a line, the special name of those neurons is the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron. Now, both of, of these neurons in their name have this part right here, synaptic, synaptic. That part synaptic comes from the word synapse. So a synapse, this is an important neuron word for us to know. A synapse is a place where two neurons meet. A synapse, a place where two neurons meet. Or if uh, you remember from our discussion of the neuromuscular junction, it could also be the place where a neuron meets a muscle cell. So a synapse is just basically a place where two cells meet and they're talking to each other. So when we talk about a synapse, the place where things are talking to each other, some of my neurons are presynaptic, some of my neurons are postsynaptic. Any ideas in the chat for me? What might presynaptic mean or postsynaptic? Any ideas what those beginning parts might mean? Yeah, so Andrew is totally right. Pre means before, before, and post means after, absolutely. Post equals after. We talk about neurons talking to each other. Um, we're gonna have a neuron that's called the presynaptic neuron, meaning it comes before the synapse. And we're gonna have a neuron that's called the postsynaptic neuron. That's the neuron that I find after the synapse. Another way to think about presynaptic neurons and postsynaptic neurons, a presynaptic neuron brings the message to the synapse. It's the one that comes before the meeting place. It's bringing the information. The postsynaptic neuron receives the message or it collects that information. So my, my bringer, if you will, is called the presynaptic neuron. That's the one that, that's found before the synapse. At the synapse, it sends a message to the postsynaptic neuron. The postsynaptic neuron is my receiver. This is who's gonna get the message. Okay, here's where we're gonna put Dr. Aulis's sketching skills to the test here. If I can draw penguins, I can draw neurons, right? Let's make this happen. You've got a space in your notes for you to draw this too, by the way. Can anyone tell me what page we're on? What page do I make you draw some neurons on? Okay, page number three. Okay, so we are gonna draw a string of two neurons that are talking to each other. Oh man, this neuron is beautiful. Sarcasm there. Okay, here's my first neuron. I'm gonna give it a nucleus, a little eye there. Here is my second neuron. Okay, and here comes that line there. All right, here are my two neurons. A couple of things that we need to label when we're thinking about our neurons here. First thing we need to label is their synapse, the place where they meet. So a synapse is a space, it's, it's an opening. So right here, 
the place where the dendrites, the one neuron, are connecting with the axon terminals or the synaptic end bulb, whatever lab word you learned there. This space where they meet with each other, that's called the synapse. So let me type that on there. That is my synapse, the meeting point right there. That means that this neuron over here is the one who comes before the synapse. This is the neuron who's bringing a message down along its axon, bringing the message to the synapse. That makes this neuron right here the presynaptic neuron. The presynaptic neuron. And we've got this neuron right here. This is the neuron that has its dendrites at the synapse. Remember that dendrites receive information. The name of my neurons that receive information are postsynaptic neurons. Postsynaptic neurons. So my second neuron over here, we're going to label this one the postsynaptic neuron. Awesome. We've drawn a very simple and very basic string of neurons. One neuron talks to another neuron. The presynaptic neuron brings a message to the synapse. At the synapse, the postsynaptic neuron receives it. Okay, that's really simplified. In real life, we're definitely gonna have more than just two neurons that are talking to each other. Again, we're gonna, we're gonna test my artistic abilities here. This time, we're going to make a string of three neurons in a row. So when you're drawing your neurons, again, they probably look much better than mine here. Here's my second neuron. Okay. And I'm going to add one more. They just keep getting more and more sad the farther we go in our circuit. <laughs> All right, there's my last one. Again, hopefully your neurons look much more beautiful than mine. Okay. I now have a string of three neurons in a row. This is kind of like that picture that we started with in our class time today, where we had like a sensory neuron and an interneuron, a motor neuron. Um, very commonly, we're going to have at least three, probably many more neurons talking to each other. Before we can label them with names like presynaptic and postsynaptic, we need to find all of our synapses. Now remind me in the chat, uh, what happens at a synapse or where are synapses kind of in general? What's a synapse? Yeah, so a synapse, a place where there's communication, absolutely, uh, where neighboring neurons meet with each other. Perfect. So here is, oops, see if I can draw it. Here's a synapse right here where one neuron is, is meeting another one. Here is my other synapse that I see right here. Got two synapses going on here. So I'll label it here's synapse and a synapse. Perfect. Okay. Now, let's start with my synapse right here. This neuron that I see on the left side of this synapse, what would I call this neuron right here that's bringing information to the synapse? What are those ones called? Yeah, those ones are called presynaptic. Presynaptic, bringing information to the synapse. And this one right here is receiving information from the synapse. What's the word that I use to describe this one? If it receives information. Yeah, if I receive information, I'm after the synapse. I'm postsynaptic. Check this out. Presynaptic and postsynaptic is always relative to a synapse. Because when I look at this synapse over here, suddenly this is the neuron that's bringing information to this synapse. And this is the neuron 
that's receiving information from this synapse. If this is the neuron that brings information to the synapse, what was that word again? Who brings information to the synapse? Yeah, if you, if you bring information, you're presynaptic, presynaptic. I think we have no arguments, right, about, but my friend over on the right, he's definitely the postsynaptic, synaptic neuron. Here's the point of, of this exercise, besides just learning how to draw neurons, right, as fun as that is. The, the point of this exercise is when we're talking about presynaptic and postsynaptic, we have to make sure that we keep straight which synapse or which place that neurons are meeting are we talking about. So when I have neurons in a, in a bunch of long chain here, most likely a neuron is not only going to be a, a, a postsynaptic neuron, meaning it's receiving a message, it's probably also always going to become a presynaptic neuron as well, bringing information to somebody else. So as we start talking about the mechanism or the way that neurons talk to each other, just remember, as soon as a neuron receives a message, if that message is some hot gossip, it's got to share it with somebody else. It's got to bring that information to another synapse where it talks to its neighboring neuron. And again, if that is some hot gossip, this neuron that received the information has just got to share it with somebody else. So synapse, the place where we meet, the place where we share information. If you're bringing a message to the place we meet, I call you presynaptic. If you're receiving that information, you're called postsynaptic, at least until you go and share that information. Um, so Christina asked the question, we can have many synapses until a message is received. Um, yes. So, <clears throat> excuse me, at some point, we're going to have what we call an effector. At some point, we'll say that our example here, our goal was to activate a muscle cell. So here's my muscle cell over here. It will say it's, it's skeletal muscle. I'm going to add some multiple nuclei here. At some point, we're going to reach what we call an effector. So an effector is whatever our goal was to activate. Here, I can make it even better. Let's give it some striations, right? Look at my sketching skills today. I am on point. So we will go through as many synapses as it takes until we get to our effector. So until we get to the muscle that we're trying to contract, until we get to the gland that's supposed to make saliva, um, until we get to the place that's supposed to spit out some hormones. So yeah, we'll just keep having synapses until we get to the place that, that we're aiming for. And for some parts of the body, that is a ton of synapses. Uh, but yeah, we're just gonna keep doing this until we get to where we're going, absolutely. How do we feel about synapses? Presynaptic, postsynaptic. Yeah, Christina, as long as my neurons function correctly, um, there shouldn't be a limit. If, if my neurons don't function correctly, um, we could lose a signal along the way. But if they're doing their job, it should be able to go anywhere as long as, as it wants to, absolutely. Okay, so here's my wink, wink, nudge, nudge. On the homework, please pay attention to which synapse we're talking about, because I do give you a chain of, of neurons. So make sure if I'm talking to you about synapse number one or synapse number two, make sure to read these questions carefully. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge from Dr. Aulis, right? Because we know that, that Dr. Aulis asks her questions that we have to pay attention to. So. Check that out with these questions on the assignment. Oh, my, my thing doesn't work here. Um, so if, if we were doing this in PowerPoint, this little neuron here would be dancing around and these little charges would be dancing around next to it. I like to crack the joke that this is a neuron that's like my daughter. 
um, Little Miss Excitable. She's very easily excited, um, for better or for worse. Um, when we think about neurons, neurons are also excitable cells. Technically, what excitable means uh, is that I can change my membrane charge. That's all excitable technically means. But when we're thinking about neurons, think about that communication they're doing with their neighbors only happening because they change their membrane charge. Now, I love this picture, not only because normally it would dance, but also because check out these, these little charges that I see. Notice how the inside of this cell is negative and the outside is positive. Just having a little nerd out moment here. Like it's totally correct, right? Because what was that resting membrane potential number again? What's the resting membrane potential on a neuron? I'll type that, that long word, resting membrane potential which remember was just a fancy word for my normal membrane charge. Yep, we're nailing it. Normal membrane charge, negative 70 millivolts. Negative 70 millivolts. So the inside of my neuron is negative, the outside is positive. At least until I start sending and receiving messages and then I change it. That's this excitable thing. And I'm gonna change it from negative 70 inside do something more positive if we're getting excited. Here's that graph. We're all groaning, right? This graph has come back to haunt us. We saw this in unit number one. I'm going to talk you through this graph again, just like we did in unit number one. As, as I talk about this graph, consider taking some notes uh, independent of any of the questions you have in your notes packet right now. Let's start here at the beginning. Time number one. We see it over here. We are at rest. This is when we're at our resting membrane potential. A neuron is excitable. It's waiting to hear something. To be ready to hear something, it has to start at negative 70. So a neuron's chilling out at negative 70, it's waiting to hear something. Now, when it hears something, we see this point on the graph called a stimulus applied. Now, a stimulus is, is just something that changes. I'll give us a little, um, a little heads up or a little pre-knowledge here. When we talk about the stimulus that's being applied at this point on our graph, we're talking about neurotransmitters. We're talking about the kinds of chemicals that one neuron uses to talk to another neuron. When those chemicals are received by my excitable cell that's waiting, it generates an electrical charge. It changes my membrane charge. Remember from unit number one, that if I change my charge enough, I hit a value that's called threshold. Does anyone remember? What kind of gates open at threshold? Which kind of gated channels open when I hit threshold? Yeah, a couple of us have chimed in. Threshold is when I, I hit this charge of negative 55. If I hit a charge and that opens me up, that's going to be something that is a voltage gated channel, voltage gated channel. And it is technically sodium. I'll put that on there since we're saying sodium. I need you to help me out in the chat. Several of us mentioned chemically gated channels. Where can you describe for me? How do I open up those chemically gated channels? Do we see a place on the graph where I've got those chemically gated channels? Yeah, so, so Jacqueline and, and Nicole are mentioning number two. Yep, and the chemical that's opening a chemically gated channel is these neurotransmitters. Yep, so it's neurotransmitters that open up chemically gated channels. 
chemically gated sodium channels. Chemically gated channels, remember, need a chemical key to get open. That chemical key that opens up chemically gated channels is neurotransmitters. So a neurotransmitter attaches. That's going to cause my sodium ions to rush into the cell. Because remember, we're a salty banana. Here's where it comes back to haunt us, right? We rush in some sodium until we hit threshold until my charge is different enough from rest that my excitable cell can't contain her excitement anymore. She's got to go all the way positive. We just got to do it. I do that with my voltage gated sodium channels because I hit this charge that was different enough from normal. I get all the way up here to positive 30 and this is the point where a neuron is going to talk to its neighbor. So we got our little texting symbol here because this is the point when one neuron talks to another. So when a neuron talks, I'll add that label for us. Up here at the top of my graph, that's when a neuron talks to its neighbor. But once it talks to its neighbor, it realizes, wait a minute, my membrane charge is completely wrong. I'm gonna open up a type of channel that helps me to get back to normal what kind of channel do I use over here to help me get back to normal? I should move these guys. Yeah, over here on the opposite side is when I'm gonna use my voltage-gated potassium channels. Voltage-gated potassium channels. Voltage-gated because they open when the charge is, is too high, when it's positive 30, and potassium because remember, I can spit out potassium to make my charge inside get more negative. So I spit out and I spit out and I spit out all of these potassiums to get my membrane charge back down to normal. Yeah, Tierney is totally right. Potassium rushes out. I saw a good question in the chat, a good reminder for us about the uh, sodium potassium pump. Does anyone happen to remember, what did we say that the job of the sodium potassium pump was? That was a long time ago. The sodium potassium pump. Yeah, so the sodium potassium pump was what I used to polarize the membrane of a cell. So to get a cell to negative 70 millivolts, that's the job of the sodium potassium pump. Yeah, so Nicole's reminding us a few of the important things about it. Um, this is, a, is something that does active transport, meaning it requires energy to happen. And the reason it's going to require energy to happen is because I'm pushing sodium outside, where there's already a lot of it, and I'm bringing potassium in, where there's already a lot of it. The sodium potassium pump is not going to help me repolarize my membrane. What it is going to help me do, though, is I, I have this point right here where my membrane actually gets too negative. See these voltage-gated potassium channels? They're really great at spitting out potassium. They're not really great at closing fast enough. So I have this period down here. We call it hyperpolarization when I'm actually more negative than resting membrane potential. It's because I spit out too much potassium. There's not enough potassium left. I got extra negative. So what happens then is I'll use the sodium potassium pump to restore my balance to get me back to normal. I'm also going to use leakage channels, leakage channels. So, so two kinds of channels help me out here at the end. Leakage channels, where I, I kind of leak back toward normal, but also, perhaps more importantly, my sodium-potassium pump, helping me to go from being too negative back to normal, where I'm back here at rest, resting membrane potential. 
We must know on this graph, we got to know the number 70. We've got to know the number 55. We've got to know the number 30. First thing we need to know are numbers. Second thing that we need to know are the particular types of channels that are involved in each of these processes. If flashcards are helpful for you, what you could do would be printing out a picture of this graph or you can totally freehand it. It doesn't have to be perfect. Draw yourself this graph and circle a part of it. So this part right here. And your, your flashcard is which kind of channels are activated right here. Or your flashcard has a circle around this part. It says which kind of channels are activated here. Which kind of channels do this. We need to know which type of channels do each of these kinds of things. We also need to know when they open. So what I mean by that is the threshold value, negative 55, that is the charge when voltage gated sodium channels open up. If I stay underneath threshold, if I don't get to this charge right here, voltage gated sodium channels won't open because they need the voltage negative 55. If I never get there, no dice, we're not talking to each other. In this section right here, it's all chemically gated channels. If I never receive neurotransmitters, I'm not gonna do this part of the graph either. I need to have the right chemicals to allow me to open up the channels in, in my membrane. When I get up here to positive 30, this positive 30 is what opens up my voltage gated potassium channels. It's never going to happen that a neuron would only get halfway there just because of, of the way the channels work. It's always going to get to positive 30, but it's not until I get to positive 30 that a voltage gated potassium channel would open up. So keep that in mind. Voltage gated. That's why we got to memorize those numbers. Voltage positive 30. That's going to open up the potassium ones. Voltage negative 55. That's going to up open up the sodium ones. Uh, so I'm reading my question here. So a neuron can talk to its neighbor at 55 or 30. Um, the only place that a neuron can talk to its neighbor is when it gets to 30. So it has to go all the way up to 30 to be able to talk to its neighbor. But once I hit negative 55, I'm guaranteed to go all the way up. So if I hit this threshold value, if I change my membrane charge, just enough to hit threshold, I'm gonna go all the way to positive 30. I can't talk to my neighbor until I get to positive 30, but if I get here, if I get to threshold, I'm going to get all the way to positive 30. It's just gonna happen because of science. <laughs> That's the way science works. Once I start opening a voltage gated sodium channel, everybody's gonna open up, we are gonna get here. So only place I talk is right here at positive 30. To get to positive 30, first, I've got to hit negative 55. Once I've hit negative 55, I will get all the way up here to talk to my neighbor. I know, <laughs> Nicole likes that, because science. I, I don't have a better explanation. Does someone have a better explanation? <laughs> I, I feel like I'm, I'm uh, like that would be the way that I would try not to explain it to, to my four-year-old. She asked some really good questions. Why do things work this way? We try to be honest. We try not to say, because science. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, Nicole asked, can I add on the group of people? Um, that can be your, your answer, and then just make sure underneath it in parentheses, you have a better answer than that, right? Because <laughs> science won't quite get you full credit, unfortunately. <laughs> No, see the actual explanation of why when I hit here, I'm gonna get up here, is because my voltage is wrong enough that all of these voltage gated channels are going to open. They have no choice, they, they can't even. As soon as we hit negative 55, everybody opens up and we stay open up. Because science, right? <laughs> okay, 
We're going to pause on this graph for today because we're going to come back to this again and again and again. The, the last thing I want to cover with us today um, in, in our neuron discussion here is I want to cover the idea of depolarizing and hyperpolarizing changes in membrane charge. <laughs> yeah, Glory's like, well, I guess I should learn that graph since we're we're gonna do it so much. Yeah, it'll probably help you hate it less if we start start working on it. Well, here, let's back up one. When we talk about the way that neurons talk to each other, they use neurotransmitters. They use chemical messages. Now, those chemical messages are always going to open up chemically gated ion channels. Neurotransmitters equal chemicals. Let's see if I can type this. Neurotransmitters equal chemicals. And chemicals open chemically gated channels. When we talk about the kinds of chemicals, or excuse me, the kinds of channels that we're, we're going to open, uh, there are three kinds of chemically gated channels that neurotransmitters can open. First kind is chemically gated sodium channels. Second kind is chemically gated potassium channels. Third is chemically gated I'm missing chloride, chloride channels. Notice how these are the same three ions that we started with our class today when we did our, our salty banana. When a neuron sends a chemical, sends a neurotransmitter that opens a chemically gated sodium channel, does anyone remember? Did sodium make the membrane more positive or more negative? What did sodium do? Yeah, sodium makes us more positive. Remember, sodium rushes in and brings its positive charge with us. So a chemically gated sodium channel makes the membrane more positive. The word I use for making the membrane more positive is I call it depolarizing. So this is a depolarizing message. It makes me more positive. If a neuron spits out a, a neurotransmitter that attaches to a chemically gated sodium channel, that's going to depolarize the membrane. It's going to make it more positive. Remember that my goal is to go from negative 70 to negative 55. I've got to get 15 millivolts more positive. So if you send me a message that opens up a chemically gated sodium channel, you're going to help me get closer to threshold. You're going to help me get closer to being able to talk to my neighbor. When we talked about chemically gated chloride channels, what did chemically gated chloride channels do to the charge on my membrane? Did those ones make it more positive or more negative? Now, these were the ones that made the membrane more negative. Remember that on this type of channel, chloride rushes into the cell and brings its negative charge with it. This is called hyperpolarizing. Hyperpolarizing. That's a fancy word for saying I make it more negative. So depolarizing makes things more positive, brings me closer to threshold. Hyperpolarizing means I've become more negative. It's harder for me to talk to my neighbor. What did we say about potassium again? Does potassium make me more positive or more negative? What happens with, with potassium? That yeah, makes the membrane more negative. Makes the membrane more negative. But remember, 
potassium's positive charges start getting spit out. That means we end up more negative. That means we're doing that fancy word, we're hyperpolarizing. Hyperpolarizing the membrane. Wow, <laughs> that's my four year old. <laughs> um, try to block her, I will try to do the same, right? Okay, when we talk about, about these channels, here's what we need to keep in mind. If you are trying to get a neuron to talk to its neighbor at a different synapse, you're gonna wanna spit out a chemical that makes the charge on its membrane more positive. If I spit out a message that makes your membrane charge more positive, if I open up your chemically gated sodium channels, that's gonna make you more likely to talk to your neighbor. If I want you to stay quiet, if I don't want you to talk to your neighbor, I'm going to spit out a chemical that opens up a potassium channel because that's going to make you spit out potassium and get more negative. It's going to take you farther away from threshold. Or I'm going to spit out a chemical that attaches to a chloride channel because if I open that chloride channel, your charge is also going to get more negative. So neurons can talk to each other with lots of different kinds of neurotransmitters but there's only three kinds of channels that I can open up with a neurotransmitter. Either it's a sodium channel, makes me want to talk to my neighbor, or it's a potassium channel or a chloride channel, I don't want to talk anymore. So when we, we start again on Wednesday, we're going to look at, let me pull it up here, this picture here. We're going to get to here. What this picture shows me is the kind of stuff that a neuron goes through when it's listening to a bunch of different messages. Some of those messages are what we call EPSPs, excitatory postsynaptic potentials. We'll type that, excitatory postsynaptic potentials. Those are messages that make the membrane charge get more positive. These are the kind of messages that when you sent me a chemical, it opened up my chemically gated sodium channels. So, okay, perfect. Ariel says this picture is on page nine. Yeah, so we'll, we'll dive into this in depth Wednesday. So sometimes I, I spit out chemicals that open up a chemically gated sodium channel that makes my membrane charge get more positive. And hey, look, I spit out another chemical that made the membrane charge get more positive. Awesome. But then I also got a chemical that made the membrane charge more negative. Notice how this particular message that I received right here made my membrane charge go down. And I have another one over here that made my membrane charge go down. Whenever a neuron wants to be able to talk to its neighbor, it's got to, got to hit this, this threshold value. If I don't make it to threshold, I'm never going to make it all the way to positive 30. And positive 30 is what I've got to hit to be able to talk to my neighbor. So an excitatory message, one that allows me to take sodium inside, that's going to make me get more positive. I'm getting excited. I'm getting excited. I'm almost to threshold here. But sometimes I'm going to get an, it's called an inhibitory neurotransmitter. That's going to make my membrane charge go down. Oh, I'm not as close to being able to talk to my neighbor as I was before. I'm going back down. I'm not as close. But if I get a message that gets me to threshold, at that point, I don't have to listen to messages anymore. I'm just going to go into my voltage gated channels. Remember, because science, this is where because science happens right here. We do voltage gated channels that take over once I hit threshold. But before that, we're going to do all kinds of, of mixing of messages, sodiums, chlorides, potassium, all that jazz, until we hit this point right here, until we hit threshold. So that's a teaser for us, Wednesday's class. I can't remember exactly where in the packet I ask you to try to get to by Wednesday. Um, definitely at least try to get through like page 10. Probably it, it, I, I want you to get through somewhere along action potentials, maybe. Um, we'll cover the rest of the packet on Friday. 
though I would recommend, yeah, so I said page 10, aim for at least page 10, if not farther, if possible. Um, this is another one of those process chapters, right? Like it was with muscles. So it would really help um, if we knew, or if we at least reviewed the content from, from the entire chapter. Uh, we'll see if we if we haven't gotten there by Wednesday, that's okay. Remember that our last session this week for lecture is on Friday instead of Thursday. Uh, so Wednesday morning, get through page 10. By Friday morning, try to have gotten through all of those pages and try maybe at least one attempt on on that homework assignment to, to see if if we can identify some of the kinds of questions we have. Um, yeah, so Gloria said she worked on this last week. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so Gloria, just go back then. Uh, sounds like maybe you need to work on lesson number nine, the muscle stuff. Um, this picture we actually used in lesson number nine, too. So this one should look familiar. It's just coming back to haunt us. Um, this one's new, though, when we're talking about neurons here. All right. Any last minute questions before we end our recording for the night before my daughter dies <laughs> she's having great fun out there in the living room <laughs> anybody else have uh yelling littles that are, are going nuts out there <laughs> Um, Jacqueline, I just finished upgrading everyone's current events today. I am hoping in the next couple of days um, to start working on those group wikis. Um, those manual grade by hands are a beast. So hopefully um, by the weekend at the latest, um, I think I have, um, gosh, I have like 45 or 50 groups to work through. So um, hopefully by the weekend, everyone's wikis will be graded. Yeah, you're welcome, Hannah. Glad it glad it was helpful. Um, office hours tomorrow. Um, I, I think I will be on at 11, actually. Let me check my, my schedule here and see. Office hours tomorrow starting at, um, where did I put it? Yep, starting at 11. So 11 to 12.30, um, I will, will definitely be around. So if you have some questions, feel free to, to stop by then. Yeah, Christina, we were in solidarity, right? <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, Cindy, <laughs> got, got the kids going nuts. Yeah, so we will continue working on this on Wednesday. If you have questions you want to chat with me about tomorrow, um, unstructured office hour times from 11 to 12.30. Otherwise, I hope to see a bunch of you guys back on Wednesday. So have a great evening. Good luck with any of your yelling children as well. <laughs>